All right, guys, we're here with Harold, um, and we are here to do whatever we feel like because it's our space. Um, all right, Harold, I got a question for you. So you've opened, you're about to open the fifth restaurant? The brunch place is five? Yeah. You lost count, guys. You lost Six. count. All right, sixth restaurant in the last two years. Yes. And that includes COVID, where restaurants were shutting down. We opened the first one during COVID. During COVID. Always a smart idea, open a restaurant during COVID. Absolutely. So, uh, what was the thing that you realized you guys got right that other, that other restaurants were getting wrong? We didn't think about it. We just did it. <laughs> Action. Action. Okay, cool. I mean, at the end of the day, we weren't supposed to win. Okay. Like, with the way we created everything, how we created it. We didn't make a business plan. We didn't, you know, look at the market analysis and see what trends were out there and whatnot. We just found yeah. something that we believed in and went off the spirit. Nice. So I know restaurants, they talk about, like, it takes three to five years to, like, recoup cost. It takes you know, marketing is horrible. It's so hard to get it up and running. Um, but you guys seem to come, like, every time you launch something, you come out of the gate pretty strong. How are you doing that versus what, I, what I've seen other restaurants do where they just kind of, they're lucky to get any traction out of the gate? Uh, well, I don't want to, like, just say that everything I've launched has been, like, perfect like that. Um, shoots, for sure. The first one, yeah. we recouped our costs in the first three months. Um, and it's also because we came in with very little investment. So okay. opening up in a food hall was probably like the key thing. You know, it only cost us, you know, a quarter of a hundred thousand dollars to open up the first one, nice. at least to like get our lease and lock in the location and then maybe another 30,000 for equipment and whatnot. So, you know, all in, we didn't even spend a hundred grand to open up the first location. So that alone like allows you to become profitable faster. Yeah. Uh, most restaurants operate at about 10% like net profit um, per location. Uh, we were operating at about 35, 40 when we first opened. Um, I'd say the difference is we put, we do put marketing first. Yeah. Obviously concept has to be important. It has to be good. The food has to be good. The experience has to be right. But if you can't get people in the door, then it doesn't really matter anyway. So, yeah. so the, the lower cost to get in these, to get in the spot, was that also because of COVID? Like basically the location was hurting for people to pay them rent, so? No, not at all. Oh, I okay. mean, it was just, we went into a, the food hall that we got in wasn't even built yet. So oh, okay. when we signed the lease in 2019, in March of 2019, the location had, if you go to the location, if you were to go to back to the location where it is now in 2019, when we first signed the lease, it'd be like a rundown abandoned building. Nice. So we didn't know what it was going to look like other than like concepts and, um, you know, that we've seen. Okay. And it was in an area where you never really thought like they would put something like that. Um, so, no, it wasn't it wasn't that like it really was just going into a food hall. It's a different type of like footprint than a normal brick and mortar restaurant. Um, it's 15 restaurant units inside of one big location. So um, typically a lot of these different like food halls actually like front the bill when they're doing the building nice. you just pay more on the back end on the rent side of things gotcha yeah so you've had conversations with other restaurant owners about marketing and things like that what is is there something or a couple things that like pop up all the time when people are asking you for advice from a marketing perspective because your background is in you know digital marketing things like that what kind of things are you seeing recurring when you're giving advice to people like that uh, a lot of people don't want to spend money. Um, I think, you know, coming in the restaurant industry, like a lot of people are chefs first or, you know, maybe they had family that was in the restaurant, so they grew up in the restaurant. So in their mindset, it's like, you know, we kind of wait for the people to come. Like we build it, they'll come. Um, and then it's also that mindset of like, well, if I'm going to spend, you know, 20% of my revenue on ad spend, it's like, how does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of them are very reluctant to actually try to do any type of like marketing. And if they do, they don't see any reason to want to pay somebody else to do it. They feel like they can do it on their own. Gotcha. Um, so that's honestly the majority of what I hear from like other restaurant owners. But there is like a large crowd of the 
like the restaurant industry itself, just like a lot of other industries, is actually more private equity owned than anything. Okay. So it's a lot of big, big brands. Like yeah. you look at like your Taco Bell or um, Domino's, for instance, Pizza Hut. Like Pizza Hut is owned by another big brand. Yeah. Um, I believe it's Fat Brands that uh, acquired them. And so, so they own like multiple other concepts across the board. Um, so they're looking at it differently. They're looking at it like, hey, we're w willing to spend a lot of money on marketing because yeah. they're not just banking on the 10% net profit of one location. They're banking on the 10% or 20% net profit of Volume. hundreds of thousands of locations. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a different vibe depending on who you're speaking to. Gotcha. So what are... What do you try to tell like the mom and pop restaurant owner who's struggling for like, how do I spend money over on marketing if I'm just barely making, you know, if I'm making 10% profit margins as it is? So I'll say two things. One, it's starting to look at things at scale. Like if you got into this thing to just run a restaurant, then there's really no point in you just keeping one location and looking at it like, how can I make this one thing just grow? Yeah. Um, cause it's not going to make sense. So you have to be willing to like lose that money on, on ad spend or invest that money on ad spend so that you can grow the brand and eventually open up more locations. Okay. Cause if you have a, if you have a issue, a lot of restaurants don't even operate at 10% profit. And a lot of reasons, a lot of the times it's not necessarily because their marketing is not in, on point. It's because they, their operations is jacked up. Like you should be spending no more than like 60% on your food and labor. So if you're already at like 70% or 75%, you haven't negotiated your cost to get your co your cogs down. You haven't negotiated to, um, or, or invested in like equipment or things to make labor lesser in your stores, then you're already going to have a problem anyways. It won't make sense for you to invest yeah. into ads. So uh, there's that. And then the other side of things I would say is like, you know, even if you are a mom and pop and you're just looking at like, okay, maybe we just want to get to that 10%. We don't mind just working inside of the store. It's investing in like the very low cost things are just going to have a massive impact. So like Google business listings, Yelp listings, um, taking the time to learn how to optimize those things so you can actually, you know, get organic traffic from those different places. Um, learn how to shoot food, like get a camera, yeah. like get a phone and learn how to actually make videos with your phone and use, you know, organic social media um buy influencers you know pay a thousand dollars an influencer to post but the right influencer and you know with that alone you can generate like decent amount of dollars yeah. to actually you know make your thing work it's just at the end of the day you're still probably going to be working in it do you think the fact that they're because you and i from a digital marketing perspective we've we've marketed not just on a national scale but on a global scale for different brands do you think the mom and pop restaurant has an advantage or a disadvantage to marketing to, you know, like a two or five mile radius or whatever? I think that the re smaller restaurants have a massive advantage right now in that one, we can pivot faster. We can make decisions quicker. Like you look at like Jamba Juice, for instance, like they just now launched an app. Well, maybe not just now. This is probably like maybe a year and a half ago. Yeah. But like a year and a half ago, they launched an app. But it's like Jamba Juice has been around forever. They yeah. have money to invest in stuff like that. But there's a lot more that has to go into a decision to do something like that. You know, there's a lot of politics. They might have shareholders or things like that. If they're a public company, they have to, you know, consider what decisions they're making. Um, so I would say the biggest thing for us is like as smaller restaurants as we can make those types of decisions faster invest in those little um, uh, tweaks and, and softwares out there that maybe the bigger restaurants aren't using yet. Yeah. And then, yeah, like really capitalize on the local local area. Yeah, so like, um, for instance, like right now, there's a lot of um, uh, smaller restaurants that are able to benefit off of like new softwares that are coming out for the smaller restaurants. Mm -hmm. So like it's kind of like similar to how like e-commerce was where like all the tools are in our hands now. Yeah. Um, and the restaurant industry has been like far behind for a really long time and it still is. Yeah. But now because, you know, technology and the restaurant industry is going digital because of COVID, all of the different tools that we used to use are now able to be used at 
you know, a single small business level as opposed to most of these things are only available yeah. at the enterprise level. That makes sense. But to answer your question about the local thing, yeah, mm -hmm. I think like we're able to hit the local community much better because for instance, like uh, I was at a, an event with, um, or I was at a dinner a couple nights ago with uh, one of the uh, co-founders of, well, not co-founder, he's the son of the guy that started Flame Boiler. Yeah. And so he's, he handles all their technology. And I was talking to like their, uh, mar one of their marketing per people. And they're like, right now, all the ads they run are all awareness ads. Like, they don't run anything direct to get a conversion and whatnot. Yeah. And it's also because they're managing, you know, 150 different locations. So it's hard to do that at a single level. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So what are some of the tools that you're seeing have been helpful for the smaller restaurant company right now? Yeah. So there's a company called Marquee. Uh, Marquee is like, you've probably seen this, like, they have directory listings platforms yeah. where you can launch, like, push out your, you know, your lo local business to like 80 different, you know, listings, Yelp, yeah. TripAdvisor, MapQuest, things like that. Um, Marquee is one that's specific for restaurants. So it allows you to do that. And it also allows you to sync like all of your, uh, your addresses, your phone numbers, your, your menu, and it syncs with like your, your actual, uh, your POS's menu and stuff like that. Okay. So it keeps everything consistent. And Google feeds off of that. Like Google likes to see things that are accurate. They yeah. like to see things that are, um, they don't want like any, um, you know, misinformation. So it helps with the Google search. Um, it also creates one place for you to answer all of your reviews, which is another thing that Yelp nice. and Google also yeah. likes to see. They want people that are active answering reviews. Yep. Back in the day, it would be like you can answer within 30 days, but now it's like you need to answer a review within an hour or two yeah. hours in order to show that like you're active business. Yeah. So Marquee is one of those tools. Um, another tool we use is Ovation. So Ovation is a feedback tool that actually blew up during uh, COVID as well. Okay. And what it allows you to do is um, as a restaurant owner, you can basically have like an offer that you give to your guests after they order in the form of like a bag stuffer that goes inside of each order. Okay. And it'll ask them for like, uh, hey, leave us a survey. Um, and we'll, you know, yet for a chance to win a $100 gift card. Or nice. what we do is for third party, which is another thing to touch on. So like third party delivery, mm -hmm. um, a lot of restaurant owners like don't like it. They're like, we feel like DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats are kind of like, you know, trying to prevent us from growing. Um, and they're like attacking the industry. But one thing we can do is we can convert those third party customers into first party customers by having a bag stuffer that's like, hey, get five dollars off of your order. Yeah. If you just leave us a quick survey. But what it does is when they leave a survey, it goes directly to you. So as a restaurant owner, I, ha I can actually text that customer right away. And then I can one offer them to leave an actual review on Google or Yelp or whatever site they like. Um, and then what that does is prevents bad reviews. So it mitigates bad reviews, increases good reviews, um, and then also helps convert those third party customers into first party customers. Nice. So going back to the third party concept of like DoorDash and Grubhub and all that kind of stuff, what's the what is the negative perception versus your perception of of those tools? The negative perception is we're paying thirty percent for them to basically allow us to deliver orders. Yeah. But at the, the way you should really look at it is like, no, you're paying them 30% as a marketing fee for them to bring you customers. Yeah. Because you can increase your cost, or increase your price on DoorDash and Uber Eats yeah. and all that. They don't like it, but you can increase your price um, so that you can offset some of that cost. Um, and then you're going to get customers that you probably wouldn't have gotten anyways. Yeah. The other thing to consider that a lot of restaurant owners are, are taking a long time to really just hop on is the fact that like all the POS companies are now offering online ordering platforms as well. Yeah. So now, and what they have is DoorDash actually has a integration now with through what's called DoorDash drive, mm -hmm. which allows you to use their delivery drivers. So if you ever ordered from like Wingstop online before you're really using a DoorDash driver, yeah. it's not a Wingstop driver. Yeah. And a lot of other sites are using the same thing. So, nice. so what do you think? Is there some way to, to create a mental shift for people? Or is it just like restaurant owners are stuck in their ways, so? Um, I think it's just that. Like, even just me telling like a restaurant owner, like, hey, look at it this way. You're not paying, you're not using DoorDash as a sales platform. It's not a, a online, it's not a sales channel. It's a marketing channel. 
sim very similar to running Facebook ads or anything else. You're using yeah. it as a marketing channel. The the thing to be mindful of is that, yeah, you are paying fees and you're not getting the data. Like DoorDash gets all the data. It's yeah. very similar like the Amazon Play and e-commerce. It's yeah. like you're going to get a, a marketing channel where there's like a 90% conversion rate. Some, as soon as someone hops on your site, they're likely to buy. But, yeah, you're not getting their data. But you can work on ways to capture that data yeah. af after the fact. Um, by offering like um, Sweet Green, I don't know if you ever heard of Sweet Green. They're uh, like a salad restaurant out in um. They have a lot of locations. They they're literally at the point where they're opening like two locations like a week now oh, or wow. something like okay. that. Um, they're a public company. Uh, they went public last year, and they're really focused on like turning third party customers into first party customers. One nice. of the things that they do is they have it where like if you order from them directly online or through their app. You're going to get access to like exclusive items. You're going to get the best pricing um, and, you know, just different features like that where you're going to actually benefit from just ordering directly. So I think it's like having that shift of like you can get these people to eventually shop with you, but you can't look at it as a sales channel. You have to look at it as this is just a marketing tool that we use. Okay. So let's say I want to start a restaurant. Um what advice would you give someone? I've, I've never done it before. All I know is that, uh, let's say, me or a friend of mine or family member has this style of cooking that's unique to our area, and we know people like it. Now we want to bring it to you know the masses and start a restaurant. What would you? What would be your advice? Yeah. So there's two things. One to think about that is like even though it might be unique to your area, you should still think like, how do I go nationwide with this thing? So one, it's going to be like dumbing down that, that yeah. cuisine okay. so that it is going to fit with everybody. Um, and then taking like what is already trending or maybe not even just trending, but like what's going to actually be something that people can get behind. It's like chicken sandwiches, for instance, chicken is like the number one sold protein on, in the world. Yeah. It always has been. It probably always will be. So, um, it's like chicken sandwich was a trend that Popeyes and you know Chick Fil A had the little chicken mm. wars going on and all that. Yeah. Um, and like our chicken sandwich was like one of the number one things that like really blew us up. Yeah. So it's like figuring out okay how do you take that cuisine and then hop on also a trend with it as well or something that people are gonna be um, it's not foreign to them. Yeah. So like that's the first thing like having that, and then two is like, um, yeah like I said just thinking through like okay how do you really dumb it down to make it be something that everyone can actually enjoy wherever you go. Yeah. And then consider like, this is one thing we didn't really consider in the very beginning was thinking through like, okay, like, yeah, we could have this cool cuisine that has like these different menu items and all these different flavors and stuff, but you also got to consider like, okay, well, where's your vendors going to come from? What's your supply chain going to look like? Yeah. Um, because you don't want to have five, six, seven, eight different vendors in order to make, you know, your menu. Yeah. Because what happens at scale is now, one, you're paying just as much as in, in accounting fees to deal with that. One supplier goes down. Yeah. Now you have to find another one, and it's really hard. You can't have your people going to the store to go buy food and stuff like that to make sure you're able to actually sell. Yeah. So it's like thinking with the, the end in mind of like, okay, where do we really actually want to take this thing? Yeah. yeah. When you say dumb down the cuisine, what explain that to me a little a little more. Like... Um, Ethiopian food is like a good example, right? Like if I was to go out and ask like a hundred people right now, if they've ever had Ethiopian food, like I'd probably get maybe 10 people that are like, yeah, I, I've actually tried it before. Yeah. So it's like, how do I take Ethiopian food and make it to where it's something that when people see it, they're like, oh, okay. Like I've never had it, but like, it's something that I've, I've used to eating. Yeah. Like maybe okay. it's a rice bowl or something like that, or it's a burrito or you know, it's in a different form than what it traditionally is made in. Yeah. Um, and then like dumbing down the menu, like why have 20 different, 30 different menu items when you can just have like five solid ones. Normally you're only yeah. going to have like two really hitters that are like making all your money. I feel like, like Cheesecake Factory is the only uh, restaurant to disprove that with their yeah. 700 page menu. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I honestly, I don't like it. Yeah, like I, I don't really either. like going to, I, I don't, it's like one of my least favorite places to go to. I go there for the cheesecake. Exactly. <laughs> but I think that's also like part that's, you know, I think it's also understanding like, is that part of your marketing? Yeah. Like, is that part of like your brand? Maybe that is like, 
hey, we have this extensive menu. People are going to come here. But at the end of the day, like, we're known cheesecake. for cheesecake. Yeah. So, cool. and it would never work. I'm also speaking from a quick service restaurant perspective and a fast casual restaurant perspective. Yeah. So it is like it's different than if you start a full service restaurant. If you're doing quick service, fast casual, you can't have 10 you know, or like 20, 30, 40 different items True. on your menu unless they're all like very, very like similar in ingredients and similar in like cooking styles to where you're not using like a thousand different pieces of equipment and stuff like that. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. That's all I got. Thanks for sitting here and doing random questions. <laughs> that was fun. Oh. Cool. Sheesh, you're a really good interviewer. I love it. <laughs>